This is the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments, and he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. I know you guys are going to get a lot of value from today's guest. Uh, his name is Keith Weinhold, and he's the founder of Get Rich Education, uh, and they teach his real estate education. He also has a top-ranked podcast called Get Rich Education as well. And I know he uh, is an active contributor to Robert Kiyosaki's uh, Rich Dad Advisors blog. I think he's got a compelling story, and I, we're lucky to have him on the show. Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rod. I appreciate being here. Absolutely. So so maybe you can uh, expand on your intro and uh, speak a little bit about your uh, about your history. First First of all, where are you calling from? I think it's kind of an unusual, uh, kind of an unusual place. I live in beautiful and pristine Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> so, man, it's got to be like five in the morning there or something, right? It's a- it it actually is dark while we're doing this interview. So, um, yeah, but you know, I live where I want to live based on choice. I got out right. and saw the world. I vacationed a bunch of places, and I decided I want to live here because I want to live here, not because some job steered me here. Sure, sure. Well, I understand it's beautiful. I haven't had the pleasure of visiting there. So, so tell. Tell us a little about Keith. Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, and I was not born of entrepreneurial or real estate parents at all, but I think the abundance mindset that my parents instilled in me is get out and see the world that you live in. You know, my parents came from pretty modest means, too. My mom was clipping 25% coupons for Cheerios so that we could do the really important stuff, like our family of four could pack up our Subaru station wagon and drive from Pennsylvania out to the desert southwest and see some of the great national parks of Arizona and Utah. So, That really instilled a sense in me from a young age and get out and see the world because once you have a broader view of the world, you have a better idea of what you want. And your listener is really listening here, Rod, because they want to get what they want. They want to live better and give better. So it really all starts with that. Find out what you want. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I I, uh, I do little uh, uh, five to seven minute clips every week uh, called your driving for success tips. And one of them is absolutely uh, determining what you want. You have to have your goals. And, and of course, you have to know why you want your goals. I know that you speak about that as well. And it's the why that drives you. And, you know, I know that uh, that you've got some background in, in multifamily investing. Can you speak to that? I do. So once I decided I wanted to live in Anchorage, Alaska, Rod, I was kind of coming of age and it was time for me to buy my first home. And, you know, before we go ahead here, I just want to remind your listeners, you know, what I'm saying is kind of unusual. Okay. You want to think in unusual terms. If you think in usual terms, you're just doing normal things. Normal is doing what everyone else does. And as you know, if you do what everyone else does, you're only going to get what everyone else has, which is usually they don't have enough money at the end of the month. They're overweight. They're under vacationed and so on. So when it's time for me to come of age and buy my first home ride here in Anchorage, what I did is rather than buy a single family home, my first ever home, and I had only been a renter up to that point, my first home was a fourplex building where I lived in one unit and rented out the other three. So one day I was a rent paying tenant, and the very next day when I closed on the property, I was the one collecting three rents and having a place to live. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've, we've spoken on that many times on the podcast. Uh, people that are just getting started, it's a fantastic way to get started for a, for a lot of reasons and not, none of, uh, least of which is, uh, uh, anything up to four units is considered residential. So, uh, you're able to get much more attractive financing that you would once you go into five units, which is considered commercial. So now that's the, you're, you, you absolutely started in the business the right way. And I know that, um, since then, I believe, uh, you've, uh, I, I've read that you've done uh, larger multifamily as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I sure have. I think the fourplex was really kind of that pivot point to get me into larger properties. And and yeah, you're right. With a fourplex building, you can use an FHA loan, just three and a half percent down. With a Veterans Administration loan, you can do that with zero down. So mm-hmm. not not quite a multifamily five plus property, but a great way to get started with a bang. And you know, most people think, oh, well, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. And again, you know, coming from the rich dad philosophy, rather than saying I can't afford it, ask how can you afford 
afford it. You know, you can go ahead and use the existing tenant's rent income and use 75% of that toward your qualification on the fourplex before you even ever buy the property. So you're using other people's money to amplify your wealth before you even purchase the property. I, I want to I hammer what you just said home a little bit. I'm, I want to make sure everybody heard it, and that is – you you just because you know you have a regular job doesn't mean you can't qualify for a for a fourplex property even though it's priced out of what you would be able to qualify for if it were a single family home because like Keith just said they will allow you to use the rents from the other units that are occupied towards the, your income towards the purchase so keep that in mind guys because it really is a great opportunity i you guys know that i take free phone calls from you about 8 a week um, 30 minute phone calls and i literally just spoke to someone last week that did the exact same thing Keith that bought a fourplex got a great deal and, I mean, I can't remember what the numbers were, but he's living rent-free and cash-flowing. I mean, it was just the three units not only paid for his rent, but he's also putting money in his pocket, which is, you know, just a fantastic way to get started. And I know those of you that, that are married and have a spouse, they may not be quite as keen on this, but I can, tell, <laughs> right. I, I can tell you that this is a fantastic way to start. So, well, that's awesome. I know that uh, you're quoted as saying some things, and one of them is why 2016 is a great time to be a real estate investor. And I'd love to hear your take on that. So if you'd share that with me. Yeah, fast forwarding all the way up to the present day, 2016, why is now a good time to be a real estate investor? Like, haven't prices run up since 2010 or 2011? So is now really a good time? And yes, it is for demographic reasons and a lot of other reasons. 2016 is a fantastic time to be a real estate investor. We all know, I think, the millennials became the largest generation. In 2015, they became a larger generation than the baby boomers did. So millennials, they need a place to live. And see, millennials, they're more likely to want to be renters than any previous generation. In fact, we already have now the lowest home ownership rate in 50 to 60 years and most demographers and economists just see that that trend is going to continue, and a lot of it has to do with millennials, this largest age cohort that's moving through. Well, why is it that millennials are more likely to be renters than not? And there are a lot of reasons. Um, college costs have increased at a rate greater than the rate of inflation. That saddles, that go ahead and encumbers millennials with so much student loan debt that they can't form a down payment for a property, and that makes them a renter. And that's really good for guys like you, I, and our listeners, Rod, that millennials are more likely to be renters. And, you know, one thing with millennials, Rod, I think people kind of fail to consider, you know, they're just looking at demography and they're looking at statistics, and they are pretty powerful with forecasting this trend for why it's a great time to be a real estate investor. But the other one is a psychological component, Rod, because millennials, they saw what happened to their parents. When millennials were in their formative years, they saw their parents get caught up in the mortgage meltdown, 2008, 2009. They saw their parents lose their home through foreclosure or through short selling, or even if their parents didn't lose their home, their parents were often underwater on the home. So the millennials' parents couldn't move. That constrained their mobility. And that potential mobility constraint, that's of concern to millennials. So they have this negative psychological association with home ownership. Um, another great time, it's a great, another reason it's a great time to be a real estate investor, rather, is that interest rates are still here near historic lows on the floor. Um, the stock market's been up substantially. Some feel it's overpriced on a price to earnings ratio. So a lot of people feel like that run is close to done. So it can be a great time to potentially sell a high there. Now, someone might say, well, real estate's priced high higher now as well. But as you know, Rod, I mean, you're a cash flow based show. We buy for cash flow. So the valuation in the interim doesn't really matter that much to us. And, you know, another reason it's a great time to be a real estate investor, this is something that people completely overlook, I think, Rod, is just simply that the United States has an increasing population. The population increases by more than 1% per year. Now, we kind of discount that. That's something that we take for granted. But globally, you know, look at places, even advanced economies like Japan and uh, a lot of parts of Germany – they're losing population. That causes excess housing supply, and that hurts us from just an economics 101 supply-demand component. So there's so many reasons it's a great time to be a real estate investor, and those are really just a few. 
Yeah, no, those those are all good points and all valid points. And millennials don't want to be tied down, no question. Uh, interest rates are fantastic right now. I, I do tell my listeners, go in with both eyes wide open because, like you said, the stock market's at an all-time high. There's no telling what's going to happen with the election and the impact that's going to have on the economy. But there, there's likely to be a pullback. As you, I've interviewed billionaires on the show and macroeconomics, and they all talk about a contraction coming. So it's important to, especially those of you that are, that are flipping to be just to do it with both eyes wide open and have have a second exit strategy you know if uh, that you can rent the property if it, the market contracts and have have some length of time on your uh, on your debt don't do 12 month debt if you're in the flipping business do a little longer if you can get it just to just to play it safe but because multifamily property is based on income it's valued on income and it and you're buying based on cash flow as you said you're in a much safer place than if you're buying on value so so all very, very good points, Keith. I know that uh, I, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, you, you have mentioned that you've been involved in some other multifamily properties. Can you can you speak to those? Maybe what size and where? Yeah, sure. Why don't we could just talk about the local part of my portfolio. So, okay. you know, after, after I bought that first fourplex, what I did is I bought a second fourplex by using none of my own money. I transferred accumulated equity from the first fourplex into the second fourplex. I held on to both of those for a few years, and I had moved out with my wife to her own single family home a while. You can't get your quality of life back. You don't want to live in a fourplex uh, forever. And then at that point, the biggest deal that I had done was a 1031 exchange where I went ahead and sold both of those fourplexes that I had owned for years. And the numbers were working pretty well. Um, Between the two buildings, uh, after paying the manager, those two fourplexes cash flowed at about $1,500 a month. Mm -hmm. Um, I sold those and replaced those with an 11-unit building and an eight-unit building with the successful 1031 exchange. So all four of those properties, the two disposed of fourplexes and the two replacement properties, the 11plex and the 8plex, they were all right here in my home market of Anchorage, Alaska, which has been a good rental market. For those of you that don't, that don't know, a, a 1031 exchange basically defers the tax from the property you're selling to the property you're buying. And, and the, the, the word exchange is a little bit of a misnomer because you think exchange and you think, you know, you've got to go find somebody that wants exactly what you have and you want what they have, but that's not the case. The way it works is you're actually allowed to select property. You have a time window to select it and it does, it has to be, it has to fit some pro, some parameters. And maybe Keith, you can speak to what those are. It's been 20 years since I've done a 1031 it's cost segregation and everything else that's available these days. And I don't really sell anymore. I'm a, I'm a real estate buyer, but but I know that you pick. You have to pick a like property in some fashion. Yeah, and you have a window of time to select it, and then a window of time to close. Correct. Yeah. Now, a ten thirty one exchange. Which what I needed to do um, upon selling those two fourplex buildings is prior to those closings, I want to get what's called a ten thirty one exchange intermediary involved, um, so that at closing, the proceeds from the sale of the two fourplexes, which were almost exactly a million dollars, in the disposal of the two fourplexes. Um, after I had the proceeds and paid the sales costs and everything, the $325,000 left over after the sale of those buildings, after the mortgages were paid, went off to the 1031 exchange intermediary. And from that point at closing, I had 45 days to identify a certain number of replacement buildings. And I needed to specify the exact addresses of the replacement buildings that I was going to bring into the portfolio. And then I had 180 days from that closing close. and from the intermediary holding the 325K, yes, to close on some of those designated replacements. And you can only pick so many, and there, there's a number sure. of different rules there. Um, so, well, what did this really do for me? Well, what it able to, enabled me to do, Rod, is to increase my leverage ratio. I had about 35% equity in those two fourplexes, and I was able to take that 325 k and put 20% down payments with an in-state financing program, a program available only in my home state. Your home state might have some special in-state programs as well. So with that 325 k I was able to use that as a 20% down payment on about $1.6 million worth of apartment buildings, which ended up being that 11-plex and the 8-plex. So let's look what I've done here and how does that benefit me. So I disposed of $1 million worth of property and I replaced it with $1.6 million worth of property. My leverage ratio changed from 3 to 1 to about 5 to 1. 
I also now have 19 doors, so I'm more stable. If I have one vacancy and 19 units of property, I only have about a 5% vacancy rate. When I had the two fourplexes, if I had one vacancy, I had a 12.5% a vacancy rate. And then, of course, the main impact to me was my cash flow went from $1,500 up to about $3,500 to $4,000 with the replacement properties. So I substantially increased my income. And that's just a growth mindset. I think that's really key. That's a growth mindset one needs. A lot of people would have been so happy to sit on those two fourplex buildings and think, maybe I should get those fourplex buildings paid off. That way I can be debt free someday. And I'm telling you, this is a mindset. I'm telling your listeners, you don't want to be debt free in life nearly as much as you want to be financially free. So what I did with the 1031 exchange rod is I took a step away from being debt free. I actually took on more debt with those buildings. But I took a step closer to being financially free because my cash flow increased substantially. And I don't want to be debt free. I'm not concerned about it because as long as I have a durable income stream, I can completely outsource the debt payments to tenants. And that's exactly what I did. Don't be debt free. Be financially free. It's much more powerful. Sure. I, I mean, there's certainly like Kiyosaki talks about, there's good debt and there's bad debt. And debt on multifamily properties, like, as long as you're buying properly and, and paying attention, is, is, is much better debt to have than a uh, car payment or even your personal residence payment. I know that uh, you know a lot of people are afraid of debt, but uh, it, like, yeah. like you said, you, you, that, that's, that's, and, and uh, frankly, I can tell you that personally having my clock cleaned in 2008 with my single family properties, as many of you, you, you listening have heard, uh, the reason I did this podcast was I had 800 houses here in Florida, got my butt handed to me, but I had also had some apartment buildings yeah. and those did just fine because I, those were, those were based, those, those cash flowed and I had, I had taken my eye off the ball. I was focused on value instead of cash flow. Like you say, so, so it's easy to, it's easy to, to fear debt, but as long as you're focused on the cash flow and, you know, paying attention to the numbers, uh, there's no better way to exponentially grow your net worth and your, and your, um, your financial uh, cash flow than, than, than use, utilizing debt and utilizing leverage. I know that uh, you also have a, kind of a, some mindset myths that you like to talk about, and I think you just touched on, you just touched on a couple of them being, yeah. uh, don't be debt-free, be financially free. Can, let's, let's talk about some of the others. Yeah, there are so many wealth building myths out there. And if a person thinks about these things the wrong way, they're really only going to stay middle class at best. You know, if you want to build wealth, you need to think with a new paradigm. You need to look through a new lens. So yes, we already discussed the, you know, being debt free creates wealth. That's a myth. No one ever created wealth by retiring their debt. Being debt free just means you don't owe anyone anything. Being financially free means you don't have to work for anyone ever again if you don't want to. You know, another real myth, and it kind of ties into the example that I just laid out there, Rod, is that equity has a rate of return. The rate of return from home equity is absolutely zero. Now, the return on equity, the ROE, that's a different calculation. That's something else. But the RFE, the return from equity, is absolutely zero. And it's one of the realizations I had that made me want to do the 1031 exchange to go ahead and just shift that equity and leverage more property with the same equity when I did the exchange. Now, how is the return from equity zero? Well, that's because the presence or absence of equity in a, pro equity in a property has absolutely nothing to do with the valuation of a property. So whether there's 10% equity in a property – it has nothing to do with the fact of whether that property value goes up or down. Valuation, that's based on a number of factors like in-migration or out-migration or the availability of developable land or job expansion or job contraction or, or so many other things, but it has nothing to do with the presence or absence of equity in a home. And I think once one realizes that, they're more likely to want to spread out their equity that's been concentrated in any one property into multiple properties. And when you do that, you have a lot of advantages, not just cash flow advantages, but you might get geographic diversification. So just remember that the rate of return from equity is absolutely zero. It doesn't contribute to the growth in valuation at all. Hmm. And okay. another wealth building myth is that you know, I think a lot of conventional financial planning tells you don't work for money, get your money to work for you. And, you know, a lot of investors and a lot of Americans think that would be great if I can get more of my money working for me. What's smarter than that? What's smarter than getting my money to work for me? And you know, I think you already know, Rod, you don't want to get your money only working for you unless you're only going to be middle class. You want to get other people's money 
working for you. With real estate, when you're leveraged and you get a loan, you get other people's money working for you three ways at the same time, actually. It's three ways. You get the tenant's money to produce the income, the bank's money to produce leverage, and the government's money for generous tax incentives. You're actually using other people's money three ways at the same time. If you only use your money to try to get wealthy, I'm sorry, you're not going to get wealthy. Compound interest is lame and slow. Leverage is where wealth is created. So this whole myth of compound interest and getting your money to work for you, yeah, that's only helping out Wall Street. You know, That's not going to build wealth for you. It might just might provide a secure retirement, and that's a very precarious maybe. Yeah, no, and I'll tell you, there's a fourth as well. And the fourth would be bringing in partners and you know syndicating a deal. And there's a fourth, uh, somebody, you know, other people's money. So it's not just the bank. It's not just the the tax benefits. It's uh, you bring in you bring in partners with equity, and there's you can structure deals that way as well. Or you bring in partners with knowledge and leverage right. that knowledge as well. Other people's exactly. knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So uh, any others? Yeah, I think it's a really destructive one, and this is just so central to one's mindset, and that is that people think it is prudent and it's smart to live below your means. And there might be just a little something to be said for that, especially when you're starting out and you're just getting established and you might need to form a down payment, but you want to abandon that scarcity-minded, live below your means stuff as soon as you possibly can. It's sort of a rich dad quote, don't live below your means expand your means. Expanding is the answer. If you use those same energies to expand your means rather than living below them, you'll live a life better than you ever thought you could. So, you know, an example of live below your means, Rod, might be, you know, allowing the Groupon app on your phone to dictate where you and your spouse have dinner tomorrow night, even though you don't really care for that place, even though you weren't planning on going out. You know, now you're focusing on living below your means and you're in kind of this budget mindset world. Expanding your means, that's doing something like, you know, reading a book about a 1031 exchange and how that builds real wealth. So, you know, use your mindset and your faculties toward expanding your means, not living below them. And you're also going to build a network of people that think in a similar way, and that's going to feed back onto you and help feed your abundance mentality. Absolutely. Yeah, you you guys, you've heard me say many, many times, uh, who you hang out with is who you become, and you know you've heard it from other people than just me, I'm sure. And and it's critical to be around people that push you up and motivate you. And and uh, you know I tell you go to the local RIA meetings and and meet like-minded people, and uh, even set up your own meetup groups or your own uh, cash flow game, uh, and and get around people like that that are that are pushing forward that aren't living in fear. I read in your bio that uh, you've uh, you learned you learned about property management through some hard knocks and and I saw a couple of funny things in here. Do you mind speaking to that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um First of all, I don't believe in self-managing. The whole reason we invest in real estate is to live better and give better. Our best and highest use is not being a a manager and getting bogged down in all that. So, yeah, you really want to find a a manager that's communicative. You know, I definitely kissed a frog when I hired my first property manager, and I, I ended up finding the right one, and that's made my life infinitely better. But, yeah, I mean, just some indications. And it's easier than ever, even remotely, to tell if your manager's not doing a good job. Um, but one good indication besides just not getting good communication from your manager is, you know, when they don't have those units ready to turn, when they think that a unit's clean and they think that a unit's ready to go and they're starting to show your vacant unit to prospective tenants and it's not even ready, well, you wouldn't even want to accept a tenant that would accept the condition of a unit that's substandard. So, um, yeah, you really want great communication and you can now use things remotely like uh, we go look, we go look dot com to go have an independent person, you know, go ahead and look and check things out and, and quite cost effectively go ahead and confirm whether you've got the right manager or not. So um, but it all starts with communication from a manager. Yeah, we've we've actually you know, run ads on Craigslist to have people go by and look at properties. And and, <laughs> and, and respectfully, we disagree on on self-management. And, and, you know, that's why that's why we have these shows and and all that. I, I'm a big proponent in self-management. But that said, uh, 
You know, I know uh, those of you that, there are those of you that absolutely don't have the time to do it. You've got, you know, I, I spoke to a physician last week and he's he's like, you know, I know you like self-management. There's no way I can do it. I said, no, absolutely. I understand. The thing to remember though is, is you're going to be managing the manager. Like you said, you have to, you have to have great communication and, and you've kissed a frog. I've had, I've had frogs embezzled tens of thousands of dollars from me. And, and so I'm, I'm, you know, and, and I will tell you, it, it also relates to scale. Uh, you know, the, all the big players that I've interviewed, the Grant Cardones of the world, the, you know, the Albert Berras, the billionaire that has 35,000 units, um, all these big players, they all self-manage. I've always self-managed, you know, when I had thousand plus units, but I respect what you say as for a quality of life at some point, or if you've got, you've got other commitments like both you and I do, Keith, um, certainly um, bringing in a quality manager is a great way to go uh, if you find the right person. And, you know, there are a lot of lot of things that you have to pay attention to. And, and those of you that have signed up for my book, I speak to this at length and the reports that you need to ask for every month and insist on and the things that you can do to keep an eye on your manager. I, I, I appreciate the tip on the WeGo look. I didn't even know about that. What we typically do is we'll run an ad on Craigslist and you know, get somebody to go check things out if we need it. But uh, thank you for that. Yeah, and and on the management, and yeah, it sounds like we do we do disagree a fair bit on that. It's actually not a complete disagreement, though. Okay. I advocate for people if they can, they don't have to, but if they can, I think it's a good idea to self manage for one to two years, and then hand it over to professional management because and- self managing for one to two years gives you an appreciation for what they do. At least in my case, it helps remind me that I don't want to do it and I have a better and higher use. But what it does is it really helps me interpret that monthly property manager's statement so that you know I know whether they're being straight up with me and honest with me or, or not. No question. Um, That's the only way to learn the business. If you're going to use outside management, I completely agree that you that you do it yourself for a while so you fully understand the business. Because otherwise it's very easily it's it's easy to get screwed. It's easily get screwed on what they charge you for the maintenance and what they charge you for the for the make readies and, and you know you really need to understand the business regardless it's just like I, I've coached people on, on investing in the stock market. If you're going to invest in the stock market, learn it, understand it. Don't just rely on somebody else because when you do, that's when you get burned. So, you know, you go in with both eyes wide open. Now, yeah. I, and how do you find the right manager to begin with? You know, another tip on that, and this is something so simple, I think people overlook it sometimes, is go attend events in person, whether it's at your local RIA or whether it's at a national real estate investing conference. Get recommendations from others. Talk to real investors that are already using that property manager and ask them some questions. Um, you can often call the prospective manager and ask your prospective prospective manager for some uh, for some references uh, for some clients that that manager is already managing for. But you know they're probably just going to steer you to the best ones that are going to say the best things. So um, networking in person is a great way to help find out the right manager in your market. Absolutely, yeah. Talk to other multifamily owners and find out who they're using and do the referencing yourself. A great tip. Are you actively investing right now? Are you, you know, is there is there a particular type of property you're looking at? If if you are, oh, I'm an active real estate investor, and yeah, I think I'm pretty diversified within real estate. So I do multifamily apartment buildings locally again because I have advantages with the in-state financing program. Even though our local economy is getting pretty precarious, that's another story unto itself because we're mm-hmm. so dependent on oil, and then. And I invest in uh, other properties out of state just to get mostly that economic diversification because thing, things are getting kind of concerning in our, our sure. market here. Sure. I found some ways around that. but Well, sure. And I'll tell you, uh, well, let's, you say you found some ways around that. Let, uh, you, can't let the, you can't throw that bomb yeah. on the table. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Well, you know, people think about markets and they're, they're thinking the right way. When you go in with your investing strategy, you're thinking about finding a sound market. The market's even more important than the property. I'm sure you would probably agree with that, Rod. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. But of course, I think we all know, but sometimes we tend to overlook and forget this. Okay, the Anchorage market is precarious, for example, because our economy is so dependent on the price of a barrel of oil. And you know what's happened to the price of a barrel of oil starting over two years ago? It's it's fallen by more than half. Uh, local companies like British Petroleum and ConocoPhillips have announced layoffs, and that's really creating a, a, a negative, a, a down drain effect here in the economy. But it's really more about the sub market and the neighborhoods 
neighborhood than any market. So I've focused here locally on purchasing properties that are near the U Med, Med District, what they call the U Med District, the University Medical District locally, because I'm in a city where you're actually seeing job contraction. There are 300,000 people in Anchorage, Alaska, and now there are fewer than 300,000 people. We've lost 1,500 residents just in the past year due to this economic downdrain. But because I bought property close to the University Medical District, within that sector, there's actually job growth. And that growth is projected to continue. And, you know, as investors, we have income streams that are tied to tenants and those tenants have jobs in certain sectors. So if you think about the sectors, if you, those business sectors are located geographically within a certain submarket, focus on that. So even within a metro where we're seeing job contraction, I've served a demographic where we're seeing job expansion. Now that's that sound advice. And guys, those of you when you're doing this this macro or micro analysis of a market, you know, macro being the whole big city like Anchorage, micro being the small sector, you're you're looking at several things. You're looking at population growth, like Keith just said. You're also looking at income growth, uh, and you're looking at bus- our businesses moving in or moving out. Uh, so, you know, and of course, you're also looking at vacancy factors, and, and a lot of this um, uh, information you can find online. There's numerous websites. My book lists them all. Uh, so, you know, this is it, what's great about being in today's day and age of real estate investing is it's all on your laptop. Heck, you can even go on Google Earth, see the property. You can drive down the street in the property. You can look at the cars in the parking lot to see, get an idea of the type of tenants that live there. I mean, there's so much you can do from your from your laptop. But Keith, I... Uh, Really appreciate having you on the show today, and I, and I appreciate you getting up early to be on the show today. I'm very grateful that you're on the show and shared your wisdom with us. Well, well thanks. If I could leave your listeners with one thing, Rod, it's be bold. Make right. bold moves in life. You know, once you've got a feeling in your gut and your head backs it up, be bold. Moving from Pennsylvania to Alaska, people thought I was nuts. Making my first home a fourplex building, people thought it was nuts. Burning the bridge behind me and doing a 1031 exchange. Starting a podcast. Quitting my day job. Be bold. Yeah. That's how you're really going to create wealth in life. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate it. Let's stay in touch. I enjoyed it, Rod. Thanks All so right. much. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and then take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a five star rating and review. For more resources to connect with us further, please visit our website at lifetimecashflowpodcast.com. Tune in next week for our next show.